um, hopefully everyone can hear. If not getting sound, please let me know in the chat. Um, but this is Barb Cochran, and thanks for tolerating um, and being flexible uh, for this series. Kate, you're going to advance the slides for me. Is that right? That's right. OK, so this is the last lecture in our in geriatric health care series for winter term. Um, we are fully remote today, um, and that's why things are a little bit uh, delayed. Next slide. So just a reminder that we are focusing in this series on the primary care of older adults and uh, with a vision to engage families, caregivers, age and dementia friendly health systems, primary care providers in their communities. And today you're going to get a magnificent lecture um, that really goes into the full flavor of age friendly health systems. Our objectives in include for, for this center include transforming clinical environments to be integrated age-friendly health systems that practice the 4Ms. And I'm not going to really feel free to go to the next slide. I'm not going to go into the 4Ms because um, Dr. Bennett is going to review those for you. Next slide. This is the spring 2020 um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia lecture series. Uh, so you can see the various um, lectures that are scheduled. It is our hope that we will be back into our usual um, approach on March 31st. However, we do not have a final decision yet at the University of Washington about spring term. And so we will probably know next week if we will be in person in the room or fully remote again. Next slide. Just a reminder that I'm going to be continuing to monitor the chat for technical issues, so let me know. Um, we will open up the chat for questions for Dr. Bennett uh, during the last 15 minutes. And again, a reminder to complete the profile form if you haven't yet for this series. Uh, sign in an attendance form for each lecture you attended, particularly if you want continuing education credits. And um, please, 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 an evaluation form for each lecture attended. We use this information to make decisions for the next lecture series. Please check with your site coordinator about the format. Those um, forms will either be online for you or you will have them in hard copy. Next slide. And then post-lecture considerations, continuing education contact hours are available. Unfortunately, the um, URL for um, accessing the registration for contact hours isn't showing up very well, but your site coordinators got full information as well as a handout to um, uh, register and feel free to contact me if you don't have the continuing education information you need and want to register. My email is barbc at uw.edu and I'll put that in the chat box. You can also access the recordings online at nwgwec.org. They're posted about 48 hours after the live lecture. Um, and through that same route, you can access the 90 plus free archive lectures from past series. But just a reminder, if you access them that way, um, continuing education credits are not available, but you can through UWCNE um, get contact hours for past series. Those are online for a small fee. Next slide. And I'm very, very happy to introduce to you Catherine Bennett. She is an assistant professor of medicine, and she's also the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship Director. She is also, um, I'm trying to remember your title, Kate, Educational Director for the Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center. Um, and um, she has incredible expertise on moving us towards age-friendly health systems. She's with the Division of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine at the University of Washington and a wonderful colleague to work with. So Kate is gonna talk to us today about age-friendly care of older adults. Thanks so much, Barb. I appreciate that introduction and I'm so glad you invited me here to speak today. Um, as Barb mentioned, I am a geriatrician. I practice over at 
Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, which has been an interesting place to work of late um, and is always an interesting place to work. I love it. Um, I practice in clinically in the inpatient setting on geriatrics consults, also um, primary care of older adults in our senior care clinic and have spent quite a bit of time practicing in skilled nursing facil facility settings. Uh, but I do spend a lot of my time in education and in curriculum development. Uh, I'm really glad to talk to you about age-friendly care of older adults. We have a long way to go, um, but there are some fantastic tools that can help you along that journey. I have no financial disclosures. So the objectives for today, um, I hope by the end of this hour that I'll be speaking to you, um, that you'll be able to describe the evolution of the age-friendly health system movement. Um, and also that you'll be able to explain the four essential elements that comprise these four M's that Barb has been introducing you to throughout the, the series, um, this four M's framework of age-friendly health systems. And then finally, I hope you come away with some tools that you can use to really uh, implement age-friendly care in your own organizations. Let's start off with the case. Um, this case was adapted slightly from reality, but is um, closer to reality than, I, than I'd like it to be, but I changed just a few details for privacy reasons. Um, but I came across this case recently, uh, a 90-year-old woman um, with eight years of progressive forgetfulness, um, but had been only diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease about a year ago. She also had some well-controlled hypertension and diabetes. She uh, lives with her daughter who provides her care and walks with a walker, um, recently had a history of severe falls and started needing more assistance with walking. Uh, she was subsequently admitted to the hospital for a skin infection, which was at least partially related to her, her progressive immobility. And that has complicated by delirium, a lot of bed rest, um, which led her to become weaker. She also was noted not to have an advanced directive and no clear durable power of attorney despite having over a dozen children, which created some complications. Um, by the time she was discharged, she was bed bound, unable to walk without assistance. She was nonverbal and still had some delirium ongoing. Her blood pressure was running low on the medication she was discharged on. And after discharge, she developed some pressure ulcers, some weight loss, and eventually had a cardiac arrest at home. Um, received CPR, was taken to an emergency room where she ended up passing away. And unfortunately, this case highlights a lot of areas where we could improve quite a bit um, in the care of older adults in general. I wish this case were in isolation, but unfortunately, I come across stories like this more often than I'd like to. And I don't need to tell this audience, but I will anyway, that healthcare for older adults um, does need quite a bit of improvement. And I couldn't list all of the, the things that we could improve upon as a healthcare system and um, particularly in, in this country, but I'm gonna highlight a few things that just speak to areas that we could improve upon. For example, over 30% of older adults are prescribed potentially inappropriate medications every year. Um, these are medications that can lead to falls and cognitive impairment, for example. Um, we know we have a huge public health issue with falls. Falls are extraordinarily common in this country. Over 2.8 million injuries are treated in the ER as a result of falls every year and over 800,000 hospitalizations. And this is despite us knowing that there's evidence for, for fall prevention available to reduce these numbers. And only it's estimated that only about half of those with dementia get a dementia diagnosis, which you know, impairs your ability to actually do advanced care planning, et cetera. And this is all, even though older adults spend a ton of time interacting with the healthcare system. Um, a study out of um, Dartmouth University estimated that the average older adult in the United States has 17 contact days with healthcare in a given year, meaning that during the 17 days scattered throughout the year, the average older adult is you know, either going to a clinic or spending time in a hospital or going to a physical therapy appointment, for example. So a lot of interaction with the healthcare system, but still a lot of gaps in care. 
So I, as a geriatrician, am really interested in improving this. I did a geriatrics fellowship and practice in geriatric medicine because I really care about these issues and want to, to make a difference both with my individual patients and in education of others. And um, geriatricians are not great at concisely describing what they do because we like to do lots of things. Um, and there are lots of areas of, of focus um, in what we do in geriatric medicine. Um, but Mary Tonetti, who is a rock star of a geriatrician who has taught us a lot of what we know about fall prevention and about addressing goals of care for older adults, um, who's a professor over at Yale, she worked with a group in Canada and came up with the five M's that describe what we do in geriatric medicine. And this is what I use to describe um, my work to others now. And this is also what I tell the geriatric medicine fellows at the beginning of the year that we're gonna focus on throughout the year. And these five M's are what matters most, um, mind, thinking about dementia and delirium, mobility, particularly fall prevention, but also preventing mobility, disability in the hospital, medications, knowing you know, how age, it related changes affect drug metabolism, what medication should be avoided, how to avoid polypharmacy, how to deprescribe, and then multi-complexity when you stack a lot of multiple chronic conditions on top of each other and add in social complexity and um, caregivers and what other needs people have as far as um, community resources, that multi-complexity um, uh, captures a lot of, uh, of the last M of geriatrics. So this is how I describe my work, but of course there are um, not very many geriatricians in the United States and we can't do the work of providing the, particularly the primary care of older adults given the rapidly growing aging population. So a part of my work is to educate others on what are these principles. Um, and this is, and I'm not the only one who, is, who wants to do this. There are lots of geriatricians around the country working on this. But in 2017, um, the age-friendly health systems movement was born. And this was born in collaboration with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the Johnny Hartford Foundation in collaboration with the American Hospital Association and the Catholic Health Association of the United States. And they decided they really wanted to disseminate best practices in age-friendly care throughout the United States and make this happen much more quickly than it already was. Um, and, and that is, is the reason behind the age-friendly health systems movement that I'm gonna talk about. So what is age-friendly care as both defined by, by the IHI and Hartford Foundation, but also in general, age-friendly care follows an essential set of evidence-based practices, things we know improve the health and happiness of older adults. Um, they cause no harm and they align with what matters to the older adult and their family caregivers. So really hitting on all three of those, those points. So in developing the age-friendly health systems movement, IHI and Hartford Foundation really scoured the evidence for what we know are evidence-based models that improve the care of older adults, things like the Hospital Elder Life Program, the Program for All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly, acute care for the elderly inpatient units. A lot of models of care we know that really improve a lot of important outcomes for older adults. And they looked at how many of these models are available um, and how many patients could they potentially reach if everyone who is eligible for them actually received care under these models. And they found that just a tiny little fraction of patients who of older adult patients who could benefit from these evidence-based models were actually getting them. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. Some of them are just difficult to disseminate. Some of them are harder to reproduce in certain settings. Um, but a lot of it is just lack of dissemination of, of these models. And this all contributes to what we know in general in healthcare, but particularly for the care of older adults, is what we know is 
as far as evidence for improving care is growing rapidly, but what we're doing is lagging far behind. And so this movement is meant to close that gap more rapidly. So in order to decide how they were gonna do this, they looked at all these evidence-based care models um, and were able to, and just pulled out from each model, what are the care features that are unique to this model? Um, what are the different elements of that model? And then they looked at them and saw where there was overlap and they found 13 discrete care features. But thankfully they didn't decide to roll out the 13 M's of age-friendly care. They got together in consensus, um, a, a meeting of experts in care of older adults, a, a large group of, of advisors, and decided to narrow this down into four buckets, um, the, which are the four M's, the, that really are the essential elements of age-friendly care. And that's where the four M's came from. And these are the four M's that Barb uh, tells you about before each of the, the talks in the geriatric healthcare series. And the four M's are what matters, medication, mentation, and mobility. And these, these were developed in parallel to those five MMs I was talking about before, but you can really see that two groups independently came up with very similar features of, of what's most important in the care of older adults. And behind this is, is evidence. So again, they were using evidence-based models that improve the care of older adults to develop the four M's. And um, they were really looking for models that help achieve the triple aim, which is you know, improving the care of, improving the health of the population, improving the experience of care, and reducing per capita cost. So the triple aim achieves all of those at the same time. And for each of these M's, the care models that have been used before by providing excellent care in each of these M's, it helps achieve that triple aim. So for what matters, um, just addressing goals of care for older adult patients and their caregivers, um, a group was able to lower inpatient utilization and ICU stays. For example, in medications, a large um, model that was aimed at reducing adverse drug events was able to save a lot of money and reduce many adverse drug events. Uh, fermentation, um, you know, best practice models of care for delirium prevention and management um, can save you, um, you know, $16 for every dollar that you spend on that prevention model, which is a great return um, on, on your investment and also gets the patients what they need. And for mobility, you can de decrease hospital costs while you're also helping people stay active. So this gets patients what they need while also getting the health system what it needs in order to um, use resources appropriately. So the four M's of age-friendly health systems um, are really a great, great paradigm for thinking about best practice care for older adults. And I'll go through each of them in a little bit more detail uh, in order to describe what it is um, that they're getting at with each of these M's. Some of them are more obvious than others. For what matters, it's really important to know what is most important to each older adult, know what their outcome goals are and their care preferences, um, not just for end of life care, but for their care right now, what they're receiving right now, what are their goals, um, so that we can line up their care plan with what, what they, what's most important to them. And this is meant to be across settings of care, so not just in the outpatient setting or inpatient, but this should follow them wherever they go. For medications, we, of course, try to avoid medications when there are other ways to manage um, concerns. But if a medication is necessary, trying to use age-friendly medications that don't interfere with the other M's, with what matters, with, them, with mobility, with mentation. Um, and then mentation refers mainly to prevention, identification, treatment, and management of depression, dementia and delirium, and that's across all care settings. 
And mobility really refers to making sure older adults can move safely every day to maintain their function and to do what matters, to keep them moving so that they can do what is most important to them and what, what they value most. So a few key points about the four M's as envisioned by IHI um, are really important before I get into how to potentially implement these. All four M's are a framework. It's not a program. It's not something that you can just pull off the shelf and, and implement where you are. It's a paradigm. It's a way of thinking about care of older adults, that in every older adult, we should be thinking about the four M's, assessing and um, addressing the four M's and they're meant to be so they're meant to be implemented all together not just addressing mobility and fall prevention not just medications all four for every patient and that's where the reliably comes in reliably for every patient who is older that um, comes into your care setting whether that's inpatient outpatient or the post-acute care setting wherever you happen to be and the four M's can be implemented either across an entire health system, you can be very lofty with your goal, or it can be in, implemented in an in individual practice, and both um, have been done. They should be incorporated into what you're already doing, rather than saying, this is our current workflow, and we're gonna add this four M thing on top of it. You search in your system, and you'll find areas you're already addressing, some or maybe even all of the four M's um, and the ones you're not addressing, you can, you can integrate into your workflow or you can adjust things slightly so that you're addressing all four M's for every patient. And the tools to implement the four M's, again, because it's not a program but more of a paradigm, you could use a variety of tools to assess for the four M's and to um, address them. They don't have to be specific tools, although I'm going to give examples, but they should be evidence-based because the whole goal is to provide this high-quality evidence-based care to older adults um, that helps improve the outcomes that are most important to, to them. Um, and whatever tool you use should fit with your particular setting. You wouldn't want to use an inpatient fall prevention tool for the outpatient setting. There were five health systems that signed up at the beginning to be the pioneers of age-friendly health systems. Um, and for some of these systems, it was a single hospital or clinic, and for some, it was multiple hospitals. Um, Kaiser's listed on here, they did it at one particular Kaiser site, for example. And they really tested the four M's and worked out a lot of the kinks they did, they're holding up a sign at one of the places, PDSA, <laughs> to show that they did a lot of rapid cycle improvement to, to work this out so that um, it flows smoothly in their own system. And every one of these systems did it in a different way. So how are these four M's operationalized? Uh, there are two, two aspects of um, the age-friendly health systems movement, and if you're gonna implement it in your system. One is assessing the four M's, so some sort of screening to identify um, how a, a particular older adult is doing in each of the four M's, and then acting on things that you find that might not be ideal. If they're at risk for falls, you would address that, et cetera. Um, so it has those two arms, and just doing screening without being able to act upon it is not true age-friendly care. There's a fantastic toolkit um, that's available from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement on their age-friendly health systems website that really goes through the 4Ms in detail and gives you examples of workflows that can help you implement them and also gives you examples of, of tools to use to address each of the 4Ms, both to assess and to act upon um, those 4Ms. And I definitely recommend checking it out. It has a lot of great information all in one place. And I'm gonna go through some of the details um, in this guide and, and hit some of the highlights. And I'm gonna go through this M by M and how they 
um, recommend addressing the four M's in this IHI framework. So to assess what matters to an older adult, um, you're going to ask them what matters most to them, document it, and share what matters across the care team. And there are some tools for that that I'll share in a second. And then once you find that out, you're of course going to want to align the care plan with what you find out matters most to the patient. And this is one of the most satisfying things to do in care. Um, so the, some of the tools, uh, they offer a couple questions. If you don't have any a, a, a standard script that you use or standard set of questions that you use to elicit what matters most to your patients, they gave some examples based in evidence that are well researched. The first question on top is from the patient priorities care um, uh, program, which was developed also by Mary Chinetti, who, who created those five M's um, and uh, groups across multiple academic medical centers. And the question they suggest for the ambulatory setting is, what is the one thing about your health or healthcare you most want to focus on related to, let's say we're talking about falls, um, so that you can you know, walk your dog um, uh, as often as you'd like to, um, whatever the example is. And it involves first eliciting what does this person really enjoy doing? And then once you find that out, what can we do to work on your health condition to help you meet that goal? And then for those with serious illness, um, this question came from the serious conversation guide. The question is, what are um, your most important goals if your health situation worsens. And again, this is based in evidence. But these are just examples. Um, they provide a few tools, and these are three that I do use for, for my patients and find very useful. The first one is the Patient Priorities Care website. Patient Priorities Care is an evidence-based framework for addressing what matters most to patients in the ambulatory setting. Um, and it has uh, conversation guides and tools to really help guide your, your ability to um, easily elicit this information in a routine ambulatory, ambulatory care clinic, but also is applicable to other settings. The conversation project was actually started by an author, um, and there are, have, they have a whole board of, of advisors who have guided this project, and it is very well evidence-based. There's literature on it, but Conversation Project basically encourages older adults to have a conversation with their loved ones about what's most important to them, and also with their healthcare providers so that they can document an advanced directive. It helps them do the pre-work before writing everything down. And they have conversation project guides in multiple languages, and they also have specific conversation project guides for those with um, Alzheimer's disease or other dementias so that the patient and or their caregiver can really work on um, identifying goals of care in the setting of, of that disease. The Stanford Medicine Letter Project is great because they did a lot of research and um, had a lot of discussions with um, multi-ethnic population, and it is uh, a very culturally competent resource for eliciting goals of care. All right, let's move on to the next M, which is medications. So in the forums framework, you're going to assess um, by reviewing for and documenting high-risk medications. This is what they really chose to focus on. And then your action is to, to de-prescribe or avoid the use of high-risk medications. And there are some tools you can use um, for this, but first we should define what high-risk medications are. Um, the definition included in the forums framework and that is commonly accepted include this following list of medications. Benzodiazepines, opioids, highly anticholinergic meds, including um, diphenhydramine as an example, um, all prescription over and over-the-counter sedatives and sleep medications, muscle relaxants, tricyclic antidepressants, and antipsychotics. All of these medications um, can put you at risk for falls and uh, cognitive impairment can put you at risk for delirium when they're started um, and put you at high risk for delirium if you're in an inpatient setting in particular. 
Um, so all of them have been proven to be problematic for a variety of reasons. Some tools you can use to help you with this medication review and really um, help you choose safer medications for older adults and address what you find include the American Geriatric Society updated beers criteria. It was last updated in 2019. Um, and that's available on Geriatrics Care Online and in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. Deprescribing.org is a fantastic website that gives guidelines for deprescribing. It's developed um, at two Canadian academic medical centers, um, and they have everything you could possibly want to know about deprescribing, doing it safely, um, and gives you guidelines in, in which meds to prioritize for deprescribing. Uh, and then a patient-centered tool is the CDC Medication Personal Action Plan, which really it's available on the CDC website and provides patients um, the opportunity to list out all their medications, know what they're for, and triggers them to have discussions with their, with their prescribers about um, medications that might be risky or medications they feel aren't really aligning with, with what's, mo what's most important to them. So when thinking about mutation, this M, again, it's focusing on delirium, depression, and cognitive impairment. Uh, delirium is more of a focus on the inpatient side uh, of care, uh, also in the post-acute care setting. So in primary care, more of the focus is going to be screening for cognitive impairment and depression. Um, and then acting on what you find in this screening would include providing evidence-based management of you know, delirium, dementia, or depression when you find them. So some tools you can use to identify depression and dementia include um, for depression, the PHQ-2 and PHQ-9, which have both been validated in older adults, uh, and the geriatric depression scale is another one that you could use. Um, for dementia, you can use the MINICOG, which is just um, a three-item recall and a clock draw. So it's a quick test, but it, it really works very well to screen for cognitive impairment. The St. Louis Mental Status Exam is another, um, and one that I like to use um, in my non-native non English-speaking patients is the RUDIS, the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale. It was developed in Australia and is um, fantastic and well validated for um, people who do not have English as their first language um, and it, it doesn't have you know the mocha has a picture of a rhino um, depending on which version you're using and some people might not have ever seen a rhino um, uh, across cultures um, if they so it's much more culturally competent. It is really well validated, um, and I find it to be much better for my um, older patients um, who, you know, I have a lot of um, patients who are immigrants and or, or refugees um, from a variety of places throughout the world. Uh, I didn't put the MOCA on here. It is a great uh, screening tool, but there are some um, current um, Need, there's there's a little bit of training and um, you have to pay for that training now um, to use the MOCA. So I included the ones that are open access. Uh, for mobility, um, to screen for this, you're, to assess this, you're going to screen for mobility limitations and you also, they recommend considering screening for functional impairment. I screen for functional impairment, and that's referring to impairments in activities of daily living, um, such as the basic activities like bathing, dressing, and grooming, the higher level instrumental activities of daily living, such as med management, finances, transportation using the telephone. Um, I screen for that in all of my patients because it's so important to understand um, if anyone needs you know, addition, additional caregiver support or often functional impairment goes along with, you know, a change in, in health status and, and helps me help the patient better by doing a little bit more investigation and making sure they have what they need to maintain their independence. 
So although that's considered optional, I think it's really important for older adults. Um, and then acting upon this, you want to provide some sort of evidence-based plan to improve mobility if you find a limitation, and if you find functional impairments, you want to develop a plan for that. Some tools you can use for mobility in the outpatient setting, the timed up and go is fantastic, and you've probably heard about this before, particularly um, when discussing fall prevention. This is a great screen to determine who's at increased risk of falls. Um, and for those of you who haven't used it, basically you have the patient sit down in a chair, have them get up, walk three meters or uh, 10 feet, turn around, walk back and sit down in the chair. And you watch them do this to see what their gait looks like and if they have trouble getting from the chair, and you can also time it. Um, normal is 10 seconds, but the cutoffs used for fall prevention are often you know, taking at least 14 seconds to do it is increased risk of falls. Taking 20 seconds is, is a high risk for falls. But other people do simpler mobility assessments. And in fact, some of the pioneers of the age-friendly health system movement used um, strategies such as just watching patients walk from the waiting room to the exam room so that they can work this right into their workflow. And I try to do that. I try to set myself up in my workstation in my clinic so that I can see all of my patients walking in. Um, and it gives me an idea of, of how rapidly I need to assess that, what I need to prioritize on this particular visit. For functional assessment, there are some tools you can use. I'm listing two of them here. These are two recommended in the resource guide, but there are others. The Barthel Index um, really assesses someone's independ independence in their activities of daily living. And it's um, one of the ones recommended because it's available in some electronic health records, such as EPIC, um, as, a, as a flow sheet. It's integrated into the EMR. Um, the Lawton Index is for the instrumental activities of daily living, or IADLs, uh, and can be used um, in a clinical encounter. We don't have to do all of the work on, on the 4Ms ourselves. We should work with our partners. The Area Agencies on Aging have fantastic community resources available to, um, to work on the 4Ms. They, all area agencies on aging um, are able to provide some evidence-based programming for older adults. And it's a way for us to, to reach out beyond the walls of our clinic um, and really help address the 4Ms more holistically. The Aging and Disability uh, Business Institute, which really advocates for the dissemination of all the great work that AAAs are doing, um, and also advocates for you know appropriate funding for them, um, put out this crosswalk between the 4Ms and the evidence-based programming that they provide. And you can go to the Aging and Disabilities Institute website and see this crosswalk between the 4Ms and what community-based programming is available. And I'll just go through what their, um, what their resources um, and slides from that presentation involve. It's really helpful. I recommend you, you check it out. Um, but basically, for each program that they describe, they describe many of them, they describe the program available, um, and they chose programs that are available much more widely. Um, and then they go through each of the four M's and describe how the program might help address those four M's. And they include, because these are evidence-based programs, they include relevant outcomes to each of those four M's so that you know if you're referring your patient to these programs, how they might, uh, how might, how they might be most helpful. Area agencies on aging have a lot of resources that they can help older adults access that support the 4Ms. And I listed some examples here uh, that you might find useful and that are um, available at many area agencies on aging. 
uh, Matter of Balance is a fall prevention program that addresses both fear of falling and some um, counseling and coaching around that, as well as um, exercise to improve balance. Enhance Fitness is a, is a fitness program that also um, is proven to reduce risk of falls. Enhance Wellness is a great program that has older adults work with a health coach to help set and achieve their own personal health and wellness goals, including staying active. The Home Meds program is available at many places throughout the country, um, and it's often used in transitions of care, but essentially it's a tool that can be used um, that to assess an older adult's medication regimen to identify high-risk medications and just to ensure that um, the medications being prescribed are understood by the older adult, um, that they know what they're for and there aren't duplications, and also um, to, to make recommendations for optimizing those meds to be safe. Self-management programs such as the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program help older adults with chronic conditions through um, multiple seminars. It'll be older adults with a variety of chronic conditions um, in the same seminar discussing, you know, how to set and achieve their, their health goals and, and how, how to best manage their, their chronic diseases and stay active. And the PEARLS program is a community-based um, depression program um, originally designed for dysthymia and minor depression that has a great evidence base behind it and really works to, um, um, to help older adults stay active and engaged um, and to really address their depression effectively. So how would you operationalize the four M's? It's a lot um, and it can be done. It doesn't all have to be done in, in one clinical encounter, um, but um, as far as assessing and addressing, um, but you will want to address the four M's in some way each time um, you're working with an older adult. And a way to do that, um, it, well, not maybe you won't address all four in detail every time you work with an older adult, but you will want to make sure they're addressed for every older adult that you're encountering um, and make sure they're tracked over time. So the annual wellness visit is a great way to do this because integrated into the annual wellness visit already are the 4Ms components. So a lot of folks have found that it is um, effective and efficient to address the 4Ms in the annual wellness visit. In my senior care clinic, we do 4M screening at regular intervals as part of our routine care. We've been doing it for a really long time before this movement um, because it's just part of the core of what we're addressing with our older adult patients. So we'll assess for risk of falls and um, cognition, you know, assess someone's cognition. Um, and we do that over time and, and track it in our in our note template. So let's just just to make this less conceptual and more real world, um, let's see what this would look like for an individual patient. So Mr. Rivera is an 85-year-old man with a history of falls, moderate COPD, and depression who comes to the clinic for an annual wellness visit. To assess what matters, he's asked if he has an advanced directive and asked what he values most. And uh, he says that he does not have an advanced directive, and he gets the greatest joy from walking his dog in the neighborhood and spending time with his family. So after discussion, he shares with you that he worries that he will get injured from a fall and not be able to walk his dog. So that's a pretty clear priority. He is assessed for his mentation um, with a mini cog to assess his cognition, which is normal, and a PHQ-9, given his history of depression, and that is, is normal. Uh, for mobility, he is assessed with the timed up and go test, and it takes him 20 seconds, which is, which is abnormal and puts him at increased risk of falls. And he has some difficulty rising from the chair during the test, and his, his step height is pretty low. He's not raising his feet up very much. And as far as medications, all of his prescription and over-the-counter medications are reviewed, and he's noted to be on four medications. 
And it's noted that he's on Zolpidem for sleep. Uh, the brand name of Zolpidem is Ambien. So what, is, what sort of plan might you put together for, um, for Mr. Rivera? So for what matters, you'll, you'll share with him and discuss with him that you'll prioritize fall prevention in his plan because that's important to him and it's also important um, to you as his healthcare provider. Um, you provide him a handout from the conversation project so he can get thinking about um, his advanced care planning and what is most important to him. And then after he's had a chance to do that, you can follow up at the next visit and define that more clearly. Um, everything doesn't have to be done in one visit. It can be done slowly over time. Medications, uh, you talk to him about the risks of Zolpidem, which include increased risk of falls and fracture and also cognitive impairment. And given that he's trying to avoid falls, that aligns very well with what matters most to him. Um, and then you also educate him on some other sleep measures that don't involve medications. For mobility, you've already worked on optimizing his medications. You refer him to physical therapy, and you can refer him to the local area agency on aging to help uh, locate a fall prevention program. So that's what it might look like. You, again, might not do all of these things in one visit. Um, primary care being, uh, I always talk to the fellows about primary care being a marathon and not a sprint. Um, we, we can work on all of these things over time. So thinking back to that initial case of the, um, of the woman who had Alzheimer's disease that was diagnosed pretty late in the course, um, had a lot of falls, was admitted to the hospital for a skin infection, um, had a lot of delirium, was on bed rest, and ended up bed bound after her hospitalization um, with still with delirium and medications that were making her blood pressure low and ended up dying in an emergency room after receiving CPR. So what would that look like if we had an age-friendly version of that? So let's say this 90-year-old woman with well-controlled hypertension and diabetes is followed in a primary care setting that implements the four M's. So she would have been screened for cognitive impairment with a mini cog and also might have had a functional assessment that identified that she had trouble with some of her higher level ADLs, such as medication management and finances. So she underwent an evaluation and was diagnosed with Miles Alt mild Alzheimer's disease early on in its course. Um, she was able to discuss her priorities with her physician and her daughter, and those were to spend time with her family, and she selected her daughter as a healthcare proxy. So she would have a decision maker um, when she needed one. She had an abnormal timed up and go along the way and was referred to community-based exercise programs and educated on home safety, and she had high-risk medications um, deprescribed. So a few years later, when she was admitted to the hospital for a skin infection, her hospital stay was still complicated by delirium since she was at risk in the setting of her dementia, but it was mild because the hospital she went to had a delirium protocol to prevent and identify delirium. She was kept active during her stay, so she was walking around frequently. Um, and so after the hospitalization, she needed a walker and uh, was able to return home with her daughter with home health services. And then as her disease reached its final stages, her daughter enrolled her in hospice and she was able to spend the last days at home with her family. So this is a much better story than the story I started off with. And this is the hope and the goal of 4M's care, that older adults get what they need when they need it and are really getting care that's aligned with what's important to them. So IHI has some very lofty goals for this age-friendly health systems movement. By the end of this year, they would like to reach older adults in a thousand hospitals and practices um, and have those practices identified as age-friendly. And by 2023, by June of 2023, they want to reach 2,500 hospitals and practices and 100 post-acute communities, such as nursing, skilled nursing facilities, um, and have them recognized as age-friendly. So they're trying to roll this out very quickly. To get recognized as an age-friendly health system from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, you can do it on two different levels. Um, 
The first level is a participant. And in order to be considered a participant in age-friendly health systems, you have to describe to the IHI how you're addressing each of the four Ms. Uh, and there's a survey that they have that you can fill out on their website. If you're already doing the four Ms, um, you can just tell them how you're doing them and what tools you're using. If you want to receive this higher level um, recognition as an age-friendly health system, and this again can be an individual practice or a whole health system, you can get this committed to care excellence for older adults um, recognition. And this involves not only describing how you're doing the four Ms, but also providing data for how many older adults are reaching, are, are receiving 4Ms care, all 4Ms. So how many older adults, and you, you provide some reports over time to give them that information. And so far, as of February 15th of this year, 285 health systems reached the participant level one recognition, um, and 123 received that higher level committed to care excellence status. In order to help you along the way, they have these action communities that you can join through IHI. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty big investment, um, not in money, but in time. And it's meant for your team and your system to be very well supported um, by, you know, seven months of monthly um, virtual sessions, these, this virtual community where you learn about the four M's, learn best practices for implementing them and work on this over time and get advice and feedback and support as you go along. Um, so this is if you're ready to jump in and you would like that extra support. You don't have to join an action community to become recognized as an age-friendly health system. They also have resources that are free for anyone to download from the IHI age-friendly website and the um, web URL is up there. Um, and there are some great tools. I already mentioned one of them, which is that guide to the, the four Ms, but they also have a guide to how to integrate the four Ms into your EHR. Where would those be in your electronic health record? And they have them specific for certain electronic health records. They talk about Epic and they talk about Cerner, for example. They also have the business case for becoming an age-friendly health system. So if you wanna do it, but you need to convince folks in the executive suite um, that this is important, um, they already developed the business case for it and have a lot of information you can share and they also have some calculators so you can calculate for example what the cost savings would be in your health system or how it would reduce length of stay so you input some information from your own health system and some calculators and can get specific information but they have more general information um, in this in this resource as well um, and then they have a specific resource for what matters most. There's quite a bit here um, that can help you along the way, whether you decide to do the IHI recognition or you want to do some of this on your, on your own separately. Either way, these resources are available for everyone. The Northwest Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center, Northwest GWEC, has activities that can support your age-friendly care, and you're already participating in one of them, which is the Geriatric Healthcare Series. And as Barb, Barb mentioned in the introduction, these, um, these lectures are recorded and archived on um, the Northwest GWEC website, and there are tons of fantastic talks um, on that website that, that could help you along the way. Um, Project Echo Geriatrics is something that I run on a monthly basis that reaches throughout Washington. We have some folks from Idaho and Oregon participating. It's a monthly case-based um, one hour long session that starts with a mini didactic that's 15 to 20 minutes. And then the rest of the time is for participants to present cases uh, that are challenging um, to an interprofessional panel so that the panel and all of the participants can discuss what to do next. Um, and what you might find useful from this is we archive all of these mini didactics um, and they're on very specific topics. We just had one on um, treating depression in older adults, for example. Um, and so they're shorter and, um, 
and you can get to very specific topics quickly um, with a 15 to 20 minute recording. So I'm going to wrap up um, by just saying a few things. Um, there really are gaps that remain between the evidence base and the care for older adults and what we're actually providing. Um, but I believe that by implementing the four M's across, across the country um, and by folks signing up for this age-friendly health systems initiative, that we can more rapidly close this gap. It's just one tool to close the gap, um, but, but it is available and I, I think it is making a difference. And there are myriad resources to support your age-friendly care, whether that's the IHI version of age-friendly care or your own version. Um, but you can find tons of resources on IHI.org. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have and I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you today. Dr. Bennett, thank you so much for giving us this great overview to age-friendly healthcare systems and the four M's. I don't know, are you able to see the chat boxes or do you want me, if, if questions come across, to read them to you? Let me see if I can pull up the chat box. I don't see questions yet at this point, but... Perhaps I can pose a question and, and ask, um, do you need to have a geriatrician in on your practice in order to um, move forward with age-friendly care? Absolutely not. Um, uh, they are, this, the four M's and age-friendly care in general are meant to be implemented everywhere. Um, and the, the tools that IHA provides makes it so that um, any healthcare system has enough to work with to, to implement this. It doesn't hurt to have a geriatrician involved um, because of their, you know, their additional training and experience with this. Um, and they might have tried some things already that um, can save you some, um, some frustration along the way and to help you think through this, but you, you absolutely don't need a geriatrician to implement age-friendly care. Anyone can do it. So are you able to see the questions or would you like me to read them off to you? Oh, I can see them. Um, how does a person connect to the Project ECHO? Well, you could just reach out through on the Northwest GWEC website. We have um, Project ECHO as one of the um, that's the nwgwec.org. You can find out more information about Project ECHO, and there is a, a link there to um, get more information and potentially sign up. So, um, or if you have questions, you can also email me directly. My email is uh, bennett4, B-E-N-N-E-T-T-4, at uw.edu. Um, the... Um, Next question is, are the insurance companies looking at recognizing the 4Ms with a reimbursement rate that is higher? Um, right now, as far as I know, there is um, no higher reimbursement for 4Ms care. That being said, the 4Ms do line up with um, the MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, um, you know, the value-based care that Medicare is moving toward. And so if you are implementing 4Ms care, you are going to perform better on those MIPS. Um, and so down the line, as care reimburse, as reimbursement for care is more aligned, aligned with value um, and those MIPS, then I foresee that to be an advantage. Um, so the the age-friendly MIPS, things related to high-risk medications, et cetera, are all, um, are all things available now to report. So in that way, um, I think down the line there will be, but right now there's no additional incentive financially to implement the 4Ms other than what we know is cost-saving for health systems when the 4Ms are appropriately addressed. 
Next question. Is there any requirement anywhere to implement this program? No, there is no requirement. It is voluntary um, and um, it's available. So right now there's, there's no requirement um, to implement 4Ms. It's just a, it's a paradigm, it's a, it's a tool to um, improve the care of older adults. Um, the next question is, could you talk a bit more about the Area Agency on Aging? How is that agency initiated in a community? All right, so this is where I have a test question because I know there are area agencies on aging that participate in this, so I have to do a good job um, in describing that. Um, so the so area agencies on aging are across all uh, 50 states. Um, it's, they're funded by the Older Americans Act, and their job is to help older adults maintain their independence in the community. And so area agencies on aging in, in every area, and some areas are a whole state, and some areas are, for example, we have an area agency on aging for King County, but wherever you are, there's an area agency on aging that serves, um, serves you. And you can reach out to the Area Agency on Aging to help connect you with evidence-based programs. Um, and if you, you know, just search for Area Agencies on Aging, um, there's a locator so you can find the one for, for your area. And they all offer um, evidence-based programs. They um, generally offer case management. It's how you can access, you know, home-delivered meals, transportation, evidence-based um, exercise programs for your patients. Uh, so that's a go-to resource. They have a lot more that they do, um, but just searching for your local area agency on aging, you can connect to them. And they have a, a central phone line um, or, and or an online referral form that you can fill out to, um, to get information for your patients. And if I might interject, um, we do have, um an uh, Area Agency on Aging archived lecture on the nwgwec.org website that was presented by two primary care liaisons affiliated with the Northwest GWEC. And it's a kind of a general overview of AAAs. Great, thanks Barb. Um, the next question is, I believe there is a nursing home model being considered or being developed. So uh, I'm not, Sure. So Riverstone Health um, is who answer, asked this question, and you might know more about it than me. I do know that the 4Ms are being applied, and IHI has tools for the implementation of the 4Ms in post-acute care settings. All right, the next question is, is there a way to offer age-friendly care in a non-medical setting, for example, for social workers not connected with medical settings? And is there a template for non-medical settings? Um, the IHI age-friendly health systems movement really focuses on health systems. They do include places such as assisted living facilities, which are not really medical, but do have um, you know, it, it's not as medical as a clinic or a nursing home, of course, but um, so they ha it, this has been implemented there, but generally in the community and in a non-medical setting, this particular movement has not been implemented, but there's a separate age-friendly communities movement that area agencies on aging and other community organizations are using to make um, entire communities more age friendly. So these movements are working in parallel and there is synergy, um, but the one I talked about today is really focused on, on health systems. Okay, I think this is Barb. I think we're um, done for the day. Dr. Bennett, thank you so much for this. Um, lecture and particularly for also helping us try out for the first time a fully remote um, Jerry series lecture. Um, I hope it worked out for everyone and we're hoping also to be back in the room um, after um, 
the end of the month when our Alzheimer's disease and related dementia series starts up again, but stay tuned for that. Thanks so much, Kate. Thank you so much.